Let's pray as we begin. Father, right now, we've already been in worship. We've been learning. We've been listening. We've heard the story. We know that you're with us. As we take a look at this next story, show us what it is that you have for us right now. How you want to apply this to our situations. And even more, how you're continually calling us back to the gift to be the people that you are creating us yet again to be. Guide us, bless us, help us to listen solely for your voice. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, for years, people would come and they would ask Telemachus one specific question. Why is it that you became a monk? The answer was same every single time. He would tell people that he joined the monastic community because he disliked violence. He disliked what was going on. He disliked the wars. But one day he was out in the garden with a friend of his and they were talking about what exactly is life all about. Because of this discussion, it got the two of them on this journey that culminated in the city of Rome itself. Now, as they got there, it happened to be late in December where the Romans were celebrating the Saturnalia. Everything was decked to the T and everyone was so excited. But they were also excited for the simple fact that they had just won a major war and the slaves were brought in from the people that were left from the nations that were conquered they happened during their travels to meet a priest from one of these nations that had run away still carrying the cup that they used to celebrate the Lord's Supper as Telemachus and his friend went further into Rome they saw the Emperor holding the cup the chalice that this priest had. Telemachus turned to his friend and said, we have to go to the Colosseum. We have to know what happened. We've got to find this guy. They walked into the Colosseum, started going down the stairs, and what Telemachus then saw turned his blood cold because he saw people killing people, animals killing animals, people killing animals, so much bloodshed, and he couldn't take it anymore. So he turned to his friend and he said, I can't stay, we gotta go. And they started to leave, and just as they were about to leave, Telemachus happened to turn around. As he turned around, he saw this man there in the arena itself. Telemachus turned to his friend and says, I, said, I, I can't, I can't just stand by and do nothing and allow this bloodshed to continue. So the people saw Telemachus run down the stairs, put his hands on the top of the wall and leap down into the arena itself. Now that really surprised the emperor. The emperor at this time happened to be one of the youngest emperors in Rome's history sees this and they watch this story unfold where Telemachus goes and he tries to break up this person and another Roman soldier that happened to be fighting to the death. The Both of them push Telemachus away where he falls to the ground and the other soldier gets the best of this priest. Priest dies, soldier comes over, looks to the emperor, and during those times, they had this tradition. Either if you got the thumbs up, everything was good. If you got the thumbs down, that meant that was the end of your life. But the emperor in the crowd gave the soldier the thumbs down, and when this is happening, Telemachus is pleading with the crowd, saying, you guys are a Christian nation. You got to stop this. Remember what God has called you to. And as he's pleading, as he's trying, the shouts grow louder and louder and louder. 
for his life to be taken. So the guy takes his sword and thrusts it through Telemachus' heart. Telemachus dies immediately. Now, all of this is going through the emperor's mind. And he has nightmares about it. A few days later, he calls in his leadership and he says, I've made a decision and what I'm going to do is I'm making a public proclamation from this point forward. The games in the Colosseum are going to cease. We are no longer going to have these anymore because we are a Christian nation and we need to act accordingly. It, all it took was one life being given that many things were changed. How often is it that we forget that it was by the life of one that changed the course of this world's history forever. The book of Revelation gives us that picture where we see it saying the lamb that was slain even before the foundations of the world. That's the God that we serve. That's the Passover lamb that we follow. That is our Jesus. And even more, he is the ultimate gift that we continue to search after and continue to follow for. Today we're taking a look at the second part in our gift series. I hope you have your Bibles nearby or right beside you, whether that's the actual edition right in your hands or maybe you have your cell phone in your hands and we're looking at it electronically. Today we're going to be taking a look once again at John chapter 2. Today we'll be focusing on verses 13 to 25. Give you a couple moments to find that as we do a little bit of reflection. If you remember from last time, we saw a story of Jesus jumping into the public part of his ministry. If you remember, we also talked about that his private ministry was as much ministry as he did within the public sector. This is very important to remember because too often we, all, we only want to say that it was three and a half years that Jesus did ministry. But ministry is as much in the situations as Jesus had in the carpenter shop as it is with the healing, the teaching, and the feeding of the people that he did in the three and a half years. So we see this situation in Cana where Jesus comes to a wedding, very intimate wedding, takes water from a traditional sense, turns it up on its head, and gives them the best grape juice that that nation had ever seen before. And we end that story seeing that Jesus spends time with his family, and this is where we come into our story today. Once again, John chapter 2, looking at verses 13 to 25. Let's take a look at the story. From our scripture lesson, says this once again, The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This was very important. Anyone that was Jewish, they would come from all over the world the then known world, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. But even more than just that, the Passover lamb himself comes to Jerusalem. Jesus comes back up, comes to Jerusalem, is ready for this week of Passover, this week of stories, this week of remembering, this week of celebrating what was, but even more, they had forgotten the very fact that the Passover was celebrating who Jesus is. But by that time that Jesus was there, they had also forgotten about their past, how the Passover was reminding them of what happened in Egypt and how God had set them free. When was the last time that we actually stopped to remember how God continues to lead in our lives and how the very Passover is still applicable to us now, even though it's been fulfilled in Jesus? 
We need to be looking at our past and remembering how God continues to work in our past so that we're able to go forward into the future. But we see Jesus is in Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. If you remember just a few moments ago, I mentioned the very fact that there were people from all over the world, the then known world, that were coming to the Passover. Now, if we go anywhere, especially here in the U.S. or other countries, we have to go and we have to exchange our money for another currency. Here's where it gets very particular. Every single Passover, those of the temple started a new tradition. This was a very old tradition by this time, where in order to buy an animal, you needed to exchange your currency for the temple currency. Most of these people could not afford to bring something with them, but here's the caveat that we need to throw out in this. The people of the temple had made it a mandate by this time that no one could bring their own sacrifice. You had to buy from the temple. We talk about how the Roman tax collectors ripped people off, but no one talks about how the people at the temple ripped the people off more than the tax collectors. They were sitting there, and sometimes they would go even farther beyond where people could only buy a simple pigeon to sacrifice instead of the very lamb that God asked them to sacrifice. Now, in our lives today, are we doing that to other people? Are we taking upon ourselves to take advantage of others? Or are we continuing to give back to those in need. Jesus comes onto the scene and he sees all this commerce going on. Here's how Jesus responds. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Right there, Jesus sees this. And in his righteous anger, he bends down and he forms cords into a whip. What we need to see here is that even in Jesus's righteous anger, he did not lash out at the people. However, here's a point that I want you to understand. I hope if you're taking notes, if you're not, I hope you write this down. Note this. Even though Jesus did this, it does not mean that we are called to do this ourselves. Now, did you catch that? I hope you did. God calls us, yes, well, we'll, when we're seeing this, to have a righteous anger. But he is the one, the only one, that has that righteous judgment in his hands to execute. We are not called to be judge, jury, and executioner. We are called to be stewards of his situations and of his people, continuing to give back and continuing to show people not only to our best friend, but to the Passover lamb himself. But it doesn't just stop there. Here's where it gets interesting. And those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. Interesting, isn't it? He drives all these animals out, and then at the tables where the birds are, where at that time they would have been in cages of wood, Jesus doesn't touch the animals there. He doesn't touch the tables because he knows one simple flip will crush the cages and it will kill the animals inside. Even in his righteous anger, not only is he watching out for the people, 
He is watching out for the very animals that he created that are being used for other means. How often is it that we stop and we're taking care of God's animals ourselves? How often are we taking care of God's people? When you see someone that's being victimized, are you stopping and asking, am I part of this? Or actually, are you actually running to them to help them in their situation and be there with them as they're going through this? The whole concept of the gift is about experience, about time. God gives us as a gift to others as well as we continue to spend time with each other because it doesn't matter whether we're from Texas, Alaska, South America, Thailand, Philippines, Antarctica, wherever. Not many people from Antarctica right now. <laughs> wherever we're from, God loves us. Doesn't matter what color we're splashed with, God loves us. It doesn't matter our situation in life or work or debts or whatever. We are still God's people and he still takes care of us. Even when we have a spiritual teenage syndrome, he still looks after us because even when we turn on uh, turn our backs on him god does not turn his back on us that's how much he loves us that's how much he cares for us and that's why he continues to call us not to use righteous anger for our own situations but to go and to love people despite what they may do but here's what the disciples remember and see his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The word in the original language in the whole concept of consume is to be eaten up. But even as the grammatical structure is there, it gives an essence of, of a fire that is being stoked by gasoline into an explosion of phenomenal portions. It's a righteous anger that is done appropriately, but it's only in the divine that it can be done. We are not the ones that are called into this righteous anger. We have too much righteous indignation than righteous anger. God says, hey, let me take care of the situation. You stand and watch what will happen. But even more, as you watch, take care of my people. Take care of their situations. Take care of their needs. Minister to them as I have to you. What I have given to you, go and share with others. Don't just sit idly by but the Jews have to react to every single thing that Jesus does. Listen to this. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Literal translation. Hey boy, who do you think you are coming to us, the elite, doing this to us? Do you not know who we are? We're even better than you think we are. How dare you do this? Now, when they respond, reacted that way, Jesus could have come and said, you don't realize who you are. You need to realize who I am. Jesus really could have brought the whole force of heaven down upon their heads, but that's not how Jesus works. Jesus shows us a different way to live to help us to respond to situations like this. But this is how Jesus responds instead. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. As Jesus was saying this, the very concept from the text is that he was pointing to himself, not to his surroundings. The problem that we have with the Jewish leadership of this time 
is they took every single little thing that Jesus said as literal, not looking for what he really said. This is why Jesus used the simplistic method, teaching people in simple ways to get them to understand. That way, those that have all of this education under their bonnets will not understand because it is too simple for them to understand. That's the type of method that we need to be doing with teaching others. Keeping it so simple that we remember the Jesus of the scriptures, the scriptures that he wrote himself that continue to reflect who he is and who he is through us. So that as we do what he has called us to do, he continues to flow, continues to reflect, continues to be part of us so that when others see us, they don't see us, they see him. I, that's my prayer constantly, that as we go through our days, as we're interacting with these different people, as we're doing whatever task it is, that the moment that even if we happen to open our mouths, the only thing that they hear is what Jesus wants them to hear. The only thing that they see is what Jesus wants them to see, and that is him in him alone. But Jesus says, the Jews react again. The Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple. <laughs> and you'll raise it up in three days? Right there, they're not talking about the Sol Solomonic temple because that temple was destroyed when Nebuchadnezzar and his armies came through the second time, they leveled the city. We're talking about the temple that Herod built. Now, we forget that even during Nehemiah's time, we have a reestablishment of the temple and the temple practices, but even that was destroyed, where they didn't have what was needed. And Herod, when he came into power, in order to win favor, this is how the Romans worked, especially with the governors. In order to win the favor of the people, they often helped reestablish the norms of the religion. It took 46 years for this elaborate structure to be built. But they're throwing this at Jesus. Just like with us, times don't change. People and situations do. Jesus is standing there, tears going down his cheeks, going, you really don't get it, do you? Even with that being said, how often is it in our situations that that is happening still, where Jesus speaks truth into our lives, but we'd rather argue than listen. And we, we see him crying too much, too many times, because we're not spending the time in the relationship that we need to. But right here, states it specifically, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. The Jews say, said that they knew and understood the scriptures, but you can know and understand the scriptures, but still not have a relationship with the author. Remember, even Satan himself knows the scriptures better than we do but he fears and trembles at the very name of Jesus. As we're going through our time, it's important not just to know and understand the scriptures, but have a relationship with Jesus. And let's go one step further, making sure in that relationship that we are not even opening the door to Satan. Because the only reason why Satan's coming into our situations is because we're inviting him into them, and that's where destruction happens. God, because he is, allows this to happen for our edification, even though he's still crying through this. It's time for us to not only just reevaluate, but to fully examine what's going on so that we're able to live to the fullest the lives that Jesus calls us to live. 
Got to throw out this caveat. Even though that's been stated, it is not through our own power and our own being that we can live these lives. It is through Jesus living his life through us. That's the reason why we still live. Story continues on. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Just because it's told does not mean that it will be believed right off the bat. Sometimes it takes time. Just like different things that we plant. Some plants spring up within a matter of time. But if you go and you plant a pineapple plant or a banana tree and you expect to have produce in a few months, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Some things take years upon years upon years, and even then it takes years for it to develop. The development in certain areas of life does not depend on us. It focuses on him because this is his story and we're a part of it. But here's what's interesting, these last couple verses. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, Many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. Right there, John throws out the fact, hey, guess what, people? Jesus was doing miracles. Doesn't say, no record, but people believed because they saw. Brings this question into my, my mind right now. How many of those, at the end of the three and a half years, still believed by what they saw, or were they part of the crowd they called crucify, crucify? In our lives, we see so much, and we see how God is working in and through our lives to the letter. We believe because of the signs and the miracles and everything else, but when it comes down to it, too often we want to crucify someone because of a misstep Instead of remembering that what Jesus did, even in righteous anger, was to take care of the people, take care of the animals, take care of the situation. Judgment is not ours. Judgment is his and his alone. Yes, while many times he will give us a message to give to other people, and in that message is judgment. And too often, we are given messages and he asks us to stand up and we don't and we're going to be held accountable for that it's time for us to see to believe no matter what's going on and to continue forward in faith because we believe in a god that lives in a god that's beyond the impossible in a god that practices the possible he takes what seems to be impossible in our situation, turns it on its head and says, this has always been possible. Step out of that Schrodinger's box and get away. Get out of the box that doesn't exist and actually live for me. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus, fully God, 100%, 100% human, 100% package of confusion. Jesus still is himself. He knows the hearts, he knows the minds, he knows what's going to happen. But he continues to still do this because he knows who he is. He knows who he is, and there's no doubt. And this is what he continues to call us to, is while he is the ultimate gift to all of us, he gives us as a gift to others to serve. But to remember this, 
to remember our identity as it is in him to go out to share his love, to share his news, even without speaking a single word, knowing that because we know who we are in him, that we can continue with joy and rejoicing. And we can say this along with our final thought song, no matter what's going on, this is a good day. Let's pray. Father, how true it is that you make this a good day. Even more, you make this a great day, an amazing day, because we know that you are part of this day. You are part of our lives. Don't let us go without remembering how you're still leading, how you are the gift in our situations, in our lives, and in the lives of those around us. Guide us as we head out into this next week as we live the relationship with other people, as we build relationships with others, and also as we continue to grow in our relationship with you. Let us not forget the need of the time with you as we continue to spend time with others. Bring us back again next week as we continue to worship together as a family of faith and grow together spiritually as a group going into what you have for us. This is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Every single week, I know I say this, but it makes my heart jump for joy spending this time with you. I look forward to it every time I'm in study at my desk, knowing that we've got these two hours set aside every Sabbath afternoon to spend in encouragement, in study, in delving into the essence of God's Word. If you know someone that would be benefited by this program, feel free, spread this information to other people, invite them to come and join us so that we can continue on this journey of faith together, encouraging each other. Uh, also, feel free to give out the devotional website, uh, still at districtdevotional.blogspot.com. Tuesdays have my written devotional and Thursdays have the video. I uh, invite people to take a look at that, even if, if, it, even if it's just the YouTube site. If you, would, you or someone else would like to come on the program and like to be part of the Sabbath school panel or you got a story that you'd like to tell or you'd like to read the scripture or you'd like to sing a special music for us, I'm sure everyone would enjoy that from time to time. If you'd like to be part of the program, feel free, give us a shout out. Let, let myself or another person know we are always thrilled to have people involved because we want to grow this program so that we're able to continue to encourage others, not just here in North America, but throughout the world. It's, it's not a ministry that we're trying to make into a mega ministry where uh, the, the pastor of the ministry has all this money and all these airplanes. I already have about 12 paper airplanes on the desk. So... I think that's enough for our, for our flights, right? Mm -hmm. Or did you only want more than that? No. If you want to make paper airplanes for us, feel free to throw them on over. But I'm so glad that you're here. You being here helps us to continue on with this ministry, helps us with encouraging each other, and especially from my end, helps me in my studies as I get ready week in and week out to spend this time with you, to open up the word, to give you this message that God showed me, but even more, as I'm doing this from my heart, I'm glad that we're together because it not only gives me a chance, but it gives me the chance to go further into the Bible together with you. So with that being said, thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to with joy to see you next week as we continue to study God's Word together.
God bless.